patiently waiting. Lord, for the harvest. Well, I got the key, I got the key. Through the leaven and that kind of faith, faith to know my Say it's mine, all mine, oh Lord, oh Lord, said I come to receive, I'm patiently waiting, Lord, for the harvest, well, I got the key, I got the key. Faith to know mine, said it's mine, all oh, mine, oh Lord. Well, said I'm standing on this promise, I'm existing on this world. Oh, everything that I speak, Lord, I believe.
if you truly believe this harvest time. I believe I got some folk in there this morning. I know they've been blessed by the Lord on this morning. You can say, Preacher, I ain't waiting on harvest time. Harvest time is already here. Preacher, I woke up this morning. Praise the Lord. It's harvest time. Preacher, I'm breathing. Praise the Lord. It's harvest time. It's harvest time right now in my life because the Lord is blessing me right now. Look at somebody this morning and say, the Lord is blessing me right now. Amen. 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 We give God glory on today and we give him thanks, first of all, for all of the blessings that he has given us. For we know of assurance that without God, we would not be here at this moment. So we thank God for what it is that he is doing in our life. We thank all of you that are here with us. Praise God for those of you that are visiting. We're glad to have you here with us, as well as those of you that are watching us via live stream. We're glad to have you here with us as we start off this week, as we're kicking off our family week um, on this week. Amen, somebody. We're kicking off um, our family week um, on this week um, because I would have you to know, if you did not know it as of yet, that the family is under attack. I want you to know first and foremost that the devil's desire is to destroy the church. But he cannot destroy the church without first of all destroying the family. So that's what we want to deal with here on these, few, uh, these next few days as we're going to be um, dealing with this series of lessons that we have for our family week. And here on this morning for, um, for um, our, our consideration... We're going to be in the book of Nehemiah chapter number four, and we thank all of those that participated in the devotional part of our service. Um, we'll be in Nehemiah chapter four, um, and for time's sake, we're only going to read verse 13 and verse number 20. Grass with us, and the flower thereof shall fade away, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Everybody in this day and age wants to fight, but they want the wrong kind of fight. Everybody in this life, because if I be honest with you, no matter what family you come from, no matter what background you come from, in your background you got some issues. That from your family you have issues. Not only from your family do you have issues, a lot of times you have baggage that you carry with you from experience that you've had in your family life. And that's why in other relationships that you have, maybe it's your marriage or whatever, you can't really be successful because you're still holding on to baggage and other things that you have from your family life. Can I be honest with you and tell you that this day and age, there are children against parents? There are children rising up against their parents. There are parents rising up to do things to their children because we have battles that we need to fight, but we don't know how to fight. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 17 and verse number 21 that this kind goes not out, but by what? Fasting and prayer. We're doing too much bickering and arguing with each other, but we really need to be on our knees before God, praying and fasting and asking God to take care of the issues that we got. I ain't even got to the sermon, but we have in church already because we need to get to the point until we play every issue that you have going on in your house. You ain't got to argue about it. Every sin that your child is caught up in is not a, a green light for you to fall out with your child. Every argument that you have with your husband or every argument that you have with your wife is not a grounds to call a divorce lawyer. But we as the people of God got to deal with this stuff by fasting and by prayer. That's what we're dealing with on today. That's the kind of fight that we are in today. I want you to know that the war that is going on in your house, because if you didn't know it, it's a war zone in your house. And the war that's going on in your house is not going to be won by bullets and guns. I know you got that 38 in your nightstand by your dresser, but it's not going to be won by the 38 in your nightstand. But this war will only be won. By prayer and fasting, church. Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter number four. And for time's sake, um, we're going to read verse number 13. It says, therefore, I positioned men behind the lower parts of the wall at the openings. I set the people according to their families with their swords and their spears and their bows. And I looked 
and arose and said to the nobles and the leaders and the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord is great and terrible and terrible also means also. Then he says, fight not against, but for your brothers. Fight for your sons, fight for your daughters, fight for your wives and for your houses. Verse number 20, whenever you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there and our God will fight for us. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, dear Lord. Pray with me if you will. Father God in heaven, we are thankful on this day. Father, we're grateful for everything that you have done in our life up until this present moment. Father, I just want to thank you for being God and being God all by yourself. Father, I thank you for your word, knowing that your word is a lamp unto our feet and there's a light unto our path. Father, somebody this morning in our midst is walking in darkness as we speak. Father, I pray that you will bring a light into their life on this morning. Father, somebody may be in our midst on the day, Father, that is not saved, that does not share in our religious conviction. Father, I pray that you would draw them into a closer saving relationship with you. Father, I pray that you would hide me behind your cross, that no flesh would take any glory in that that you want to receive. And Father, if you do this for us, we'll be so ever mindful to glorify you and to give you the praise. It is in Jesus' name we pray that all those that love God say amen. 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 Look at somebody this morning. I want you to encourage them and say, you got to fight for your home. You got to fight for your home. He says, whenever you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there. Because our God will fight for us. What he's saying, church, is if you will fight for your family, God will fight for you. I want to talk to you this morning about interceding for your family, standing in the gap for your family, fighting for your family. Because I would have you to know, brothers and sisters, that the attack in the 21st century is upon your house. The devil is trying to destroy the home. We have got to understand, church, that the values that we have long cherished and the ideas that we have long had dear are something that are worth putting up a fight for. The family as we know it between a man and a woman and children is worth fighting for. Marriage is worth fighting for. Our homes are worth fighting for. And let me tell you, you got to take a stand for your house and for your children, for your marriages, for your homes, and for those values that you hold dear. And I know it's not politically correct because to say it, but I say it in shame. The devil, the nature and the makeup of the family is as it was originated, is between a man and a woman. Somebody say it with me, a man and a woman. And this, my brothers and sisters, is something worth fighting for. Because if not, the world is going to paint a picture for your children of how they ought to live or how they ought to conduct themselves. But what you got to do is you already got to plead the blood over your children before they leave your house so that they are protected from the things that they are going to face in this world that we live in. Nehemiah encountered opposition in rebuilding the walls. And he said to his enemies in the same chapter, he said, you'll have no portion here. He said, we are rebuilding the walls of our cities. We are going to rebuild our families and our homes. And he said to his enemies, you have no portion here. He went on to say that the city does not belong to you. Our homes do not belong to you because the God of heaven, he's going to help us. He will prosper us because he is committed to us. Now, young people, us, we better settle two things in this day and time. And that is, number one, we got to be committed to God. If you're going to do anything else, the first thing, the Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the what? Somebody been reading their Bible. So number one, you're going to have to be committed to God and we better be committed to your marriage. 
not only committed to your marriage, but you're going to have to be committed to your family. Because if you have any looseness in your commitment to God or your family, the devil is going to move in and divide and conquer. God said, if you will fight for your family to Nehemiah and the people, he said, if you will fight for your brothers and fight. Look at Nehemiah chapter 4 and verse number 14 again. He said, fight for your brothers, fight for your sons, fight for your daughters, fight for your wife. I'm going to say it in the singular, wife. So I don't get in trouble. Wife. Because back then, it was plural. But it's wife. Come on and say amen, somebody. Fight for your houses. And he said, if you'll fight for your house, and if you'll fight for your family, I, God Almighty, will fight for you. That's something worth fighting for, church. Our families are worth fighting for. It's not easy. It's not easy to hold your family together in the day and time that we live in. It's not easy to raise children in the day and time that we live in. Everything seems to be against the family and against the home. But when we decide that our families are a cause that's worth fighting for, God said, you know what? I'll fight for you. You got to pray for your family. Not pray on your family, but you got to pray for your family. So you got to pray for your marriage. Don't give up on it. You got to pray for it. Pray for your wife. Pray for your husband. And then you got to fight for your sons and daughters. Because church, Satan is on a rampage. But I say, devil, you may tussle, but guess what? You ain't going to get the victory. Because I'm going to stand with God. Now, the first institution before the nation was the church. And before the church, there was races of people. And before races of people, the only thing to precede the home was God himself. If the home is the number one priority of the devil, then you need to make your house your number one priority. I thank God for the little home that he gave me. I'm grateful, I'm thankful to God for the wife that he gave me. I'm grateful, I'm thankful to God for the two kids that eat me out of the house or home that he gave me. I'm thankful for them. I'm thankful that God has blessed me. The happiest times of your life are with your family. And once you start a family, your family is your number one priority. Your family is your number one priority. And if you can't lead your family, you can't lead in the church. What did the Bible say if a man know not how to take care of his own house, then how shall he care for the church of God? It ain't possible for you not to have a raggedy house but can lead God's people. You ought to enjoy your family. You ought to love your family. Because the enemy wants to do everything he can to divide and conquer and destroy the family that you have. He wants to make your family miserable. He wants to make your marriage miserable. He wants to make your relationship with your children miserable. And we are not ignorant of his devices, church. The Bible said that we're to fight with love. That's why the scripture said, husbands, love your wives. As Christ loved the church. The husband is the house band. He's the band around the house that holds it together and you fight with love. We fight because the Bible said that when we fight that God will come along beside us and fight for our families. So to my young brothers and sisters struggling to keep on holding your family together, I want to encourage you to keep on struggling because you're not in the struggle by yourself but God is right there in the struggle with you. It's costly but it's worth you fighting for. The Bible said of Noah when he built the ark for the saving of his family. In the book of Peter, it gives us a little bit more insight when it said that he was the eighth one to go on the ark. Listen at that church. He built it. He was the one out there sweating and putting the work in. He was the one preaching until his tongue had got numb and almost fell out. That was him. But Peter records and says that he was the eighth one to go on the ark. Now he had six children 
and a wife. So here's the point. When he built the ark, before the gangplank could close, and before he could get on that ark, he went out and the Bible said that he was the eighth one to enter in. That simply means, church, that he made sure his children were on the ark. He looked around and he counted one, there go two, there go three, there go four, there go five, there go six. And the scripture specific that he was the eighth one on the ark. Why did it specify that he was the eighth one on the ark? Because he was making sure that his family got saved. So that when judgment came down on the earth and the church began to rise, is a picture of the rapture. He, he made sure that his family would say, men, are we making sure that our family is on the ark? Why is it on any given Sunday morning we got more women than we got men? Why is it even after Jesus had died, and they were on their way to his burial tomb. That the only one there were the women. I guess we were still in bed. Or, or, or I don't know. I guess we were still trying to get there. What is the commitment church? What is the commitment from those that God has called to be the head and to lead? He made sure that his families were saved. We got to make sure that our sons and our daughters are in the ark church. We got to make sure. He wanted to make sure that they were on their ark. Don't leave it up to the preacher to save your children. Don't leave it up to the Sunday school teacher to teach your child what it is that they need to know about God. You ought to be teaching them in your own home. You ought to be teaching them how to pray to God. You ought to be teaching them how to trust in God for the things that they are dealing with in this life. Because if you don't cover them, the devil going to take over. He said it, as I already said in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse number 7. He said, if any provide not for his own house, for his own, especially for those of his own house, he has denied the faith. He has denied the faith. If you don't take care of what's yours, you've denied the faith. And that's worse than being an infidel. When you don't take care of what belongs to you. I, I, for me, I can't understand. You know, I guess now that I'm living it, I'm not able to understand how it is possible to have something that you're not willing to raise. I don't understand how it's possible to have something, to have a child, a person out here, and to not be a part of their life. Can I tell you, my children are going to grow up knowing how to plead the blood. Can I tell you that my children are going to grow up knowing that when tough times come, that they can turn to the Lord in the day of trouble. They are going to know that when tough times hit, this is not a green light for me to give up, but I'm going to trust in the Lord and I'm going to persevere. That's what you got to teach them because this world will turn them upside down. I love the words of Joshua when he said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And can I tell you, Job had a job. Both spell the same, Job and Job. Job had a job. In Job chapter 1, he said that he would build the altar and put a sacrifice according to the number of his household every day and it said that Job did this church continually I want you to see Job every day of his life and y'all he had 10 children God bless him and, and he had a wife and every day he said I'm Job and I have a job my job is for every one of my children I'm going to sacrifice y'all. And he would name that first child, that first child. And then he would slay an animal. And he would build the altar and put that blood on the altar. And call that child's name out before God. And then he would go to child number two. And he put blood on that altar. He built a second altar. And he did that continually day after day. Why? Because he was fighting for his family. He was saying to the demons, he was saying to wrong relationships, he was saying to drugs and alcoholism, get away from my children, get away from my family. I plead the blood over my children. One after another, they were covered because he prayed over them. And 
people say that kind of stuff is old fashioned and old school. You call it what? We trust in psychology. We trust in all this. We, we read books from Oprah's book club like that's going to do something for us. We read Dr. Phil and we listen to Yala Van Zandt and all these people. They got a bunch of problems that they ain't going to tell you about. You know, we listen to these people for guidance, but why not trust in God for the guidance that he has already offered us and he has already made available to us? And I don't know about you, but when things are going wrong in my life, I can't look to no more than human being for help. When I find my back up against the wall and when I find myself dealing with spiritual warfare, I can't call none of y'all to help me with what I'm going through. I got to look to the one that can provide the help that I need for what I'm going through. God is the one that's going to help you get your family back together. We got to bring God into it. Why we got to bring God into it? Because our emotions get us in trouble. You ever been in a conversation with somebody, maybe it's a family member, maybe it's a friend or whatever, and maybe y'all were at odds or whatever, you had some, some differentiation going between the two of you, and you wanted to make the situation better, but just because y'all got into a conversation, it just went into a totally another way. And what you thought was going to end right ended up going wrong. You ever tried to approach your children and you wanted to counsel them and you wanted to tell them something that was going to be beneficial to their life. But because they didn't want to hear you and you knew they didn't want to hear you, you kind of got offensive and, and maybe you said something that you shouldn't have said and, and it went a different way. Can I tell you as long as we try to solve these issues by ourselves, they are never going to get solved, church. We got to take these problems to the Lord God Almighty. He said, cast your cares upon me because I care for you. So if you have somebody in your family, maybe it's a child, that's out there doing something that you may not necessarily agree with or you don't like, I raise you up in the body of Christ. I raise you up in God. You know what's right, and yet you're going in opposition of God. You already know the more you talk and the more you howl, you ain't doing nothing but drawing them farther and farther away. But what you can tell them, I'm going to get down on my knees. I'm going to call on God. I'm going to ask God to intercede in your life. I'm going to ask God to intervene and to make a change because God is the only one that can change an individual church and to this day can I tell you what you mean? It, it would take a long time for families to just sit down and address all of the hurt that is present in families especially in our community church we don't deal with that we don't talk about that enough we got people in here in their 20s and their 30s messed up about something that happened when they were a child and if they would have just got the help that they need, I'm talking to somebody, you ain't got to say amen if you don't want to say amen. You got people in here that ain't got old and gray-headed now. And you still struggling with stuff from your childhood. Because we brush stuff under the table. We don't talk about stuff. You know you were wrong, but you just don't want to admit that you're wrong. And instead of talking about the situation, you want to act like you ain't did nothing. I'm preaching the gospel in here this morning. A lot of us, and because we knew we were wrong, and because we knew what we said, we shouldn't have said it, how we handled it, we should not have handled it. We try to go on and act like nothing happened, but your child still remember what you said to them. Your, that family member still remembers how you treated them. They still remember what it is that you said to them. Now, when they treated you wrong, you was going around to everybody, oh, well, well, she said this, and, and she said that, and I'm waiting on an apology, and I ain't going to the cookout, and she gonna be there. I ain't going over there, and she gonna be there. We need to get over this stuff. Let this stuff go so you can be who God has called you to be. Ain't no use to you loving the church and you can't love your family. Oh, amen. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. But you ain't talked to your sister in years. You got 
attention in your house, the TV talk more than you and your husband. We got some things that we got to deal with, church. And you trying to deal with it by ignoring it. But while you ignoring it, it's just been... And, and now, because you haven't been giving me a, the attention that I wanted, because I, don't, I feel like I'm not getting what I want on it over here, so now my heart is not over here anymore, my attention is not over here anymore, and the devil knows that my attention is not over here anymore, so when I get on the job, there goes something in my way. When I get on my phone, there's something in my way. When I look over here, there's something in my way, because I got issues that I need to deal with. How is it possible for me to be able to counsel and give advice, but I can't keep my family together? How is it possible? How is it possible for me to claim, oh, I'm on my way to heaven. I'm so glad about it. I'm in the member, I'm a member of the church. I've been doing this. I'm doing that. But you don't even know how to treat your family, let alone your brothers and your sisters. And if some of us be honest about it, most of the issues that have come up is not other folk's fault, it's your fault. We got to be real with ourselves. Just as much as we can call everybody else, else out on the stuff that they do, sometimes, church, you got to get in the mirror and say, what have you done? What part did you play in this situation? What is it that you have done? And how can you make the situation right? Your children didn't just end up crazy. They got it from somewhere. <laughs> well, you, all you do is lie. Well, you was a liar. <laughs> well, I don't know why you out there doing this. Why you all out there? You so soon forget you was out there at the American Legion at top flight at this and at that. So don't you sit over there and act like they the next thing to the devil because of the choices that they have made. Because if you be honest, you was there not so long ago. I know it, I know it. The light bulb's giving me all the amen I need. I know it, I know it. Oh, and that goes, that goes. I want to encourage, I want to speak to my older folk now. Let us get out of this attitude of looking down at the younger generation as if they ain't nothing but the devil. As if the choices that, oh, y'all just so wayward. Oh, y'all just so wrong. The things that y'all doing, you did the same stuff. And more, if you be honest. And some of y'all can be honest and say, preacher, the only reason I'm not locked up right now it because somebody here nobody. Somebody can say, preacher, the reason I'm not six feet under right now is because somebody prayed for me. Preacher, the reason I haven't lost my mind as of yet is because somebody didn't talk about me, but they prayed for me. So how do you expect? Your family to be the family that God has called it to be. When when you have issues, all y'all do is talk about each other. Everybody got to call everybody so they can get a side for the other person called. You know how we are. Well, 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 she did this, she did that. And then when they call, they say you did this and you did that. And now you got your side, they side in the truth. We got to address this stuff, church. Because we're not addressing this stuff and you got children that are, that are growing up and they're becoming young adults and they don't even know who they are. Not only do they not know who they are, they don't know where they're going. They got so many issues and things that they are dealing with and because they've never been taught to be loved or how to love, they go out here looking for love in all of the wrong places and they end up getting caught up in stuff that they should have never got caught up in had it been for a family that acted like they were supposed to act. If y'all remember, and you know, it's our job, I want to, brothers. We got to keep a watch over our family. You got to protect your children. You know, twenty-three hundred children a day in America go missing. Twenty-three 
2,300 children every day in the United States of America go missing. Many of them because of somebody that they met on some type of social media site. And, and they're going out to interact with these people. And majority of the time, those people probably in their 50s and their 60s. But they are, are putting up fake pictures and stuff like this. Get these children to believe that they are somebody else. And then they go out to somewhere thinking they're going to meet somebody. And they end up getting taken away never to see their family again. You need to be in your children's business. You need to be in your children's business. I see it on the, I don't see how 15, 14 and 15 year olds can be out at 1 and 2 o'clock in the morning killing somebody. How it even happen? What was they doing out at that time in the morning if you were not there with them? Well, I guess times have changed. I, I guess I lived on the dirt road and wasn't nobody nearby for me to go and see, but guess what? <laughs> That's something, church, you got to be a part of their life. You got to protect them from those dangers because a lot of stuff that you might know about, they don't know about. You got to protect them from that stuff. Guess what? You got to be willing to have some uncomfortable conversations. You got to be willing to have some uncomfortable conversations with your children because if you don't tell them, somebody else going to tell them. And the way that they tell them might not be the right way for them to know. So you got to train them up in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. Y'all remember Ahab and Jezebel? They lived a reckless life. Had a reckless lifestyle. They were so godless in their ways. And listen to this, y'all. They had 70 children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Seven, not seven, 17. And the Bible said that when judgment came, and that army invaded that it cut off all the heads of their children and their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren and killed 70, almost wiped the whole family out. But then you got Obed-Edom. Who is Obed-Edom? He was the man that moved the Ark of the Covenant into the house of David. That was the man that danced behind the Ark. And, and, and it was Obed Edom that brought the ark into his home and for three months it was in his house and all 70 of his children and grandchildren and great grandchildren were exposed to the ark of the covenant right there in their house in the presence of God they were so touched by it that not one of them failed to work in the temple and do the work of God the Bible said that all 70 of them worked in the temple because they had been exposed to the presence of God. Can I tell you, if you keep your children in church and if you keep them exposed to God, maybe after a while, even after you're dead and gone, they'll still be a part of the body of Christ. They'll still be serving God because you've trained them up of how they ought to live for God. From generation to generation, y'all, that blessing flowed because they obeyed God. And can I tell you something? Maybe some of the choices and decisions that you are making in your life are not just going to affect you, but there are some choices that you are going to make that are going to affect your children, that are going to affect your grandchildren, that are going to affect those that are to come after you, church. So I want to say to us, parents, people, whoever you are, fight for your home. Stay in folk business. Stay in their lives. And when you have to stand up and correct them, correct them. If it hinders and it hurts you and you have all this kind of stuff, you got to stand for what's right, church. Even when folk call you crazy, you got to stand up for what's right. People might get mad, but stand up for what's right. But if you've done your best to bring them up in the house of God, and to serve God, and you've done your best to keep them in the presence of God, and they turn away from it, guess what? You ain't got no reason to be upset because you have done what it is that God has called for you to do. He said, train them up in the fear and the admonition of God. And he said, and when they get old, they will not depart from it. That don't mean that they won't lose their mind. That won't mean that they won't get off track every now and then, but they will remember what it is that mama said and what it is that granddaddy said. They're going to 
remember those things that they were taught even when they get old. But if you don't instill it in them, they won't have anything that they can lean and that they can depend on church when those days come. As a matter of fact, I want to tell you, church, there's nothing more important than you would do than standing up for your family. There's nothing more important that you would do, church, than fighting for your family. Beware, church, of distractions that take you and your family away from the church. Beware of distractions that take you and your family away from the body of Christ. Philemon chapter 1 and verse number 2, Paul wrote a letter and he said, to the church that is in your house. Most of the time he's writing letters to churches. But he said, the church that I'm writing this letter to is in somebody's house. Do you have a church in your house? Is God present in your house? The Bible said that when we honor God, when we provide a place for him, when we fight for our families, he's going to be there for us, church. We got to be willing to fight because the devil is fighting. He's seeking. The Bible lets us know that he's already gone out as a roaring lion, seeking those that he may devour. But church, that's why we got to stay on our knees. That's why we got to stay in God's face. And we got to ask God to help us in this day and time. Because we got to be honest about the devil got such a stronghold on some people. The only way you're going to get rid of it is by fasting and by prayer. We got to be willing to call on God, church. We got to be, we tell everybody else our business. Let's start telling God about our business. Look, look, before you post it on Facebook, post it to God and see what he think about it. Let's ask God about this situation. Man, I know some of y'all, anybody here in the marriage club on Facebook, how many of y'all in the marriage club? I know I got a few of y'all probably here on the, yeah, y'all, y'all in the marriage club. And I seen somebody post something the other day and she was talking about a situation that was going on in her home between her and her husband. And she was like, well, what do y'all think I ought to do? And I come in and I say, ma'am, I say, you, you asking the wrong people. I said, because everybody in this group looking for help. <laughs> so what you going to go out in the waiting room asking somebody to operate on you for? <laughs> because when these people give you advice, they're going to give you advice from their context, right. from their vantage point. Everybody ain't dealing with the same thing. On, and if you listen to these folks, you're going to be by yourself. We look to everybody else for advice. We go to counselors and psychologists and all kinds of other people trying to get them to intervene and to help them. Well, my child, they're acting out. I want you to help them. You think God can help you with that? You think God can help the temperament that's in your child? And not only can God help the temperament that's in your child, but God can help you with patience to be able to deal with your child. The help that you need, church, can be found in God. The help that you need. So my, my honest desire and prayer today is that families would come back together. That children would again begin to respect their parents. That we live in a generation now and I can't understand it. I'm a part of it, but I can't understand it. How people are able to just talk to their parents any kind of way. Like you're talking to somebody off the street. How you just talk to your mama and talk to your daddy like they ain't nobody. My Bible said to honor your mother and your father in the earth that your days may be long. He said this is the first commandment with promise. So many young men live in this world. Got your mama and your grandmama at the cemetery crying because you didn't know how to honor your mother and your father. Caught up in a lifestyle. 
and going to an early grave because you don't know how to honor nobody. You think you big and bad. Then somebody mess around and give you a gun. Now you think you the baddest thing out down the street. But let me tell you, I don't care how bad you think you are. There's always somebody out there that's just a little bit better than you. And we get back to a place. But I know why it's happened. Can I tell you why it's happened? We done took God out of the equation. Well, my mom then used to make me go to church. I ain't gonna make my children go to church. Now, my mom then used to make me go to Bible study. My children, but you wanna go to Bible study this morning? What kind of question is that? Get up, you go in the Bible study this morning. It's time to go give God some praise because you may not recognize it or not, but all of who you are and what you have is because of God Almighty. You don't have a choice of whether or not you're going to serve God. You're going to serve God until you get out of here. Now, when you get out of here, whatever you want to go do, it. you want to go play golf on Sunday, you want to go fish, whatever you want to do, you're going to do it. But as long as you're in here, you're going to serve the Lord. What happened to that standard? What happened to that? What happened to wanting to make sure your children knew how to pray? What happened, church? What happened? I, I can remember even in my lifetime, when I was younger, when we would have youth conferences and days like that. Man, I'm talking about thousands of kids coming together from everywhere, everywhere they're coming around and we're getting together and we're singing and we're having Bible bowls and we're doing all, what happened to that stuff? Everybody got something for everybody except the children. Not realizing that when the older generation is gone, somebody got to carry the work of the Lord on. That's why we got to raise them up. We got to train them up in the fear and the admin. Junior, I hope you're listening because you're going to be preaching after a while. I hope you're listening because you're going to be doing this. You got to train them up. Now you can choose what you want to do. I wouldn't advise you to preach. I wouldn't advise it. God called you. That's a different thing, but I wouldn't advise it. We got to get back to a place, church, to where God is number one in your house to where you schedule everything else around the church. Yeah. We schedule the church around everything else. But when will we get to a place where we put God first? We put the church first. That's why some of our homes are messed up. Because we've been put God out of our houses. We've been put God out of our homes. We don't welcome him in. We don't pray like we should. We don't seek God like we should in our home. But I want to make sure that the blood is over my doorpost, church. I want to make sure that the blood has been applied over my door so that stuff that's stopping other folk's house won't stop in my house. Because the blood has been applied over my house. Let's get back to those values, church. Let's get back to the fear of God, which is the beginning of knowledge. Let's get back to raising up children in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. Church, let's get back to being who God has called us to be. Our families are in trouble. Marriages are in trouble. Relationships between parents and children, they are in trouble, church. Yes. And the only way they're going to get fixed is by the help of God. Amen. Because we play too big a part in it, that's why we can't fix it. Because we can fix everybody else. But at the end of the day, we want to absolve ourselves of all responsibility. As if we haven't done any wrong. 
as if we didn't play a part in it. But can I tell you, the only time that true healing can take place is when you're willing to admit the part that you have played in it. It's when you're willing to walk up to your husband and your wife and say, you know what? I shouldn't have said it like that. I'm sorry. When you can go to your children, even your children, when you said something to them out of anger, when you said something to them that you shouldn't have said, I'm sorry. I should not have spoken to you like that. And I want you to forgive me. That's how you got to train them up. Every time they do something, don't cuss them out. You ain't got to instruct them with cussing. And then when they go to school cussing the teacher out, you want to get mad. When they out with their little friends and just for a kick, they want to throw out a few curse words and you over here and now you got their parents that they're hurting. Now they out there talking about your children because they saying you don't know how to raise your children because your children out here cussing. Remember, in raising them that, you know what? Maybe something that I'm saying is going to stick to them. Because I, I got to be careful because I like to listen to young dolphins. You know, and I, yeah, y'all might not know who that is. Praise God. Yeah, you know, yeah, you know. I like to listen to up-to-date stuff. But I know that some things that are in there, and McKinley remind me, Trevante, turn that off sometimes, you know. Vante, turn that off. It got cussing in it. And I got to remember sometimes that there's somebody in here that that might influence. And in a place that it need not to be said, they might, unbeknownst to what it means, say something that they should not say. So we gotta just set a standard. We gotta set a standard for our children and for our homes and keep them under prayer. Pray for them while they're in your home. Pray for them when they leave your home. Pray for them. Pray that God will just keep a head of protection around them. Because the devil is out seeking to kill, steal, and destroy everything that he can get his hands on, church. And if he can get your kids, guess what? He'll get them. He'll get them. That's why you got to raise your children up. That's why you got to bring them to Bible study. That's why you got to bring them to church. Because when they go in these schools and these universities, they're being taught something else. They're being taught that billions of years ago, there was a bunch of matter and things out here. And all of a sudden, it just collided and boom, you got the earth. You got people. You got grass. You got dogs going bow wow. You got cats going meow. All of that because of a boom. Well, brother, well, well Sister Coffee, you tell me, if I go to the store and I get some butter and I get some flour and I get milk and I get eggs and sugar and everything I need to make a cake and just go in there and just throw everything in the oven, what's going to happen? <laughs> Somebody got to get in there and mix that stuff up together. Somebody got to go in there and crack the eggs. Somebody got to know how to measure that stuff and put it together. And even if all of that stuff was out there, there had to be a God somewhere to make all of that stuff happen. That's why you got to train them up in the fear and the admission of the Lord. Because if not, they'll think they originated from monkeys. Ah, they'll think they came from primates. Well, if evolution takes place, I would, I would think that evolution would continue. So if human beings get to a point where monkeys or apes or what have you get to a place to where they evolve into humans, why ain't none of the monkeys turning into humans no more? Why didn't Bubbles the chimp, as smart as he was, you know, the Michael little monkey he had, you know? Why didn't, why, why, why didn't Bubbles evolve and become Bubba? Because it's a lie and the truth is not in it. The devil wants to do any and everything he can to denounce God, to denounce the faith, to make you believe. And that's why you got to be careful. Because can I tell you, your children go kill some of any and everything. 
all of these people out here with these different views and opinions, they're going to hear some of everything. That's why you got to tell them what they need to know. You got to tell them, church. Because they can be so quickly and soon drawn away by all of this other stuff. And they'll be lost. And some people, you be honest about it, you know them too. They get so lost that you can't do nothing for them. People that at one time were members of the body of Christ but got a hope to some, and now they just out there all flipped up, up on the side, all this stuff. Because they've been given up, they've become invested in that stuff, and you can't tell them that they're wrong. I, I, in closing, I had a conversation with a friend of mine from Montgomery. He was a member of the church, raised up in the church all of his life. His mother's father is a deacon in the church. But he moved out to Nevada um, and went, went out there a year. And now he say he's a Hebrew Israelite. And he didn't change his name to Mush Talarandia, something like that. Your name, Jimmy. That's what your mama named you. He, 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 he did change his name, got, got him a Hebrew Israelite name. Now, and, and he posts all this stuff on Facebook, you know, because when they, when they get good religion, they just got to post that because they know they're right. And can't nobody tell them that they're wrong. Yeah. And so he uh, was posting the other day, and I come, he came in my inbox, and he said somewhere, he said, well, you know, you're not really living like you're supposed to. I said, why is that? He said, you're still eating swine. I said, what? I said, well, not just that. I'm eating shell, fish. I mean, all that. I mean, all of it. And I can eat it because God said. He said, no, because if you go to the book of Leviticus, God said you shouldn't eat it because it's, un it's filthy and you shouldn't eat it because of this and that. I said, well, you know your Bible, don't you? But not all of it. Follow me over to the New Testament. If you follow Peter as he goes down to the house of Simon, who is a tenor, and while he's having that vision in his dream that God shows him all kinds of four-footed beasts and animals of different kinds, and he said, rise, Peter, kill and eat. Peter said, I never eaten anything that was unclean or common. God said, Peter, what I call clean, let no man call common. So what that mean? If it can cook, I can eat it. If it can boil, if it can fry, if it can grill, I'm going to eat it. Because God said that I could. But people like that lost over simple stuff. Lost over simple stuff. That's why you got to make sure that the word is in your house. When folk come into your house, they ought to be hit by the word. People that are around you ought to know the word of God because you're living it out in your own life. Because people are becoming mixed up, y'all. They're becoming lost. Now you got people, you know, saying that God only came to save certain people. My Bible tells me that God came into this world to save sinners. That's everybody. He came for all of us. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's his desire for us. God's desire is that your house not be in shambles. But he wants your home to be together, church. He wants there to be a love and respect for the husband and the wife in your home. For the children in your home. And most of all, he wants there to be a love and respect for him in your home. If God wouldn't be pleased with it, why is it going on? Because the Bible said to him that knows to do good and does it not, it becomes sin. So if you know what's going on, God will not be pleased with it. Why are you still allowing it to go on? Don't you think that some blood will be on your hand when you stand before God? Because truth be told, you know, a lot of us, and be real with ourselves, you know, we know what the scripture says about sins and things of that nature when it comes to everybody else. But when it's your child, 
your cousin, your friend. Oh, it's fine. It's all right. <laughs> With it's somebody that we're close to. But the same way that the word hit folk that you don't know, it hit the folk that you know as well. We got to stand on the word of God, church. Either you're going to stand with God or against him. We can't straddle the fence. We can't straddle the fence, church. It's going to be one or the other. Choose you this day who it is that you're going to serve. How many of us are going to be like Jeremiah and say, we're going to serve the Lord? Amen. As for me Amen. and my house, Amen. we're going to serve the Lord. Amen. Now, what goes on when they leave my house, that's up to them and God. Right. Yeah. But while you're in my house, yes. we're going to serve the Lord. Yes. We're going to live for God. Yes. We're going to be examples for him yes. as long as you're in my home. Good. Let's live the lives that God has called for us to live, church. Good. Because I would have y'all to know, don't be ignorant of the fact the devil is out to destroy the church. He thought he had it with the pandemic, but guess what? We still here. We still here. We said, may not be everybody, but guess what? We're still here. We're still persevering. We're still pressing on, church. And we got to continue to press on. We got to continue to persevere. Because Satan is out to destroy the body of Christ. But he cannot do that until he messes up your home. That's why he wants to send the wife and the kids to church with the husband at the house. That's why. Because he wants to destroy the home. He wants that spouse to stay at home so long that it gets the other spouse to stay at home. That's what he wants to happen. That's what his desire is. So we got to keep him in our house, church. You got to make prayer the number one priority in your home. Let's start having conversations with each other. Let's stop brushing issues off. Let's stop trying to sweep everything under the couch and under the rug. Uh -huh. Let's talk about this stuff. Let's have conversations with each other so that we can have healthy relationships. So that your children will not grow up having issues and all kinds of malfunctions and dysfunctions because of what happened to them when they were younger they could have been dealt with. Let's pray, church. Let's look to God for the help that we need in our family knowing that he is the one that's able to bring them back together. So I'm making a plea this morning for families. Maybe your family may not be here, but you just want to stand in the gap for your family. I want to offer that invitation to you this morning. Some families ain't prayed together in a long time. We want to offer you that opportunity to pray together on this morning. We learn, we know how to pray on each other. Let's start praying for each other. Asking God to help each other with the things that we are dealing with and the things that we have going on. I know you may be struggling in your life, but I love you too much to allow you to succumb to the struggle that you are going through. And I'm going to ask God to help you with what you got going on. Amen. This kind going not out, but by fasting and by prayer. Yes. My brother and my sister, maybe you're here today families and I want you and I, and, I, and I want you to feel free this morning as the elders come and as they're standing families I want you to come if you feel the need to ask for prayer that God can help you to stay together to love one another that God can help you to be there for one another in your time of need maybe there's somebody here at this moment that does not share in our religious conviction somebody that at this time is not saved you're not a member of the body of Christ Come by hearing his word. Believe in what it is that you've heard. Repent of your sins. Confess Christ as your Savior. Be baptized for the remission of your sin. Allow the Lord to add you to his body. And again, if you're standing in the need of prayer on this morning, you have that opportunity to ask for prayer. For the prayers of the righteous church. They are better than much. And I believe if we be honest, if we be truthful about the matter, we all stand in need of prayer. Somebody can say, preacher, it's me. It's me. It's me, oh Lord. And I'm standing in the need of prayer. You have an opportunity at this time. Together we stand and sing the song.
Somebody pray for me. Have me on their mind. They took a little time and prayed for me. Well, you know, I'm so glad they prayed. Yes, you know, I'm so glad they prayed. Well, you know, I'm so glad they prayed for me. Well, somebody pray for me. Don't you know they have me on their mind? Took a little time, took a little time and pray for me. Don't you know I'm so glad they pray? Don't you know I'm so glad they pray? Don't you know I'm so glad they pray for me? Well, my mother prayed for me, had me on the took a little time. I'm so glad they pray. I'm so glad they pray. I'm so glad they pray for me. All my sisters pray. Don't you know they took a little time? Pray for me. Well, you know that I'm so glad they. Don't you know that I'm so glad they Don't you know that I'm so glad they pray for me All my brothers pray for me Don't you know that had me on their mind Took a little time Took a little time and prayed for me Don't you know that I'm so glad I'm so glad they pray I'm so glad I'm so glad they I'm so glad I'm so glad they pray for me. Well, my preacher pray for me. Don't you know he had me on his mind? Took a little time. Took a little time and prayed for me. I'm so glad he prayed for me. Yeah. I'm so glad they pray. Don't you know that I'm so glad they pray? Well, you know that I'm so glad they pray for everybody. See, sweet water, sweet water, pray for me. Don't you know they had me on their mind? Took a little time, took a little time and pray for. I'm so glad they pray for me. Yeah, I'm so glad they pray. Don't you know that I'm so glad they pray? Well, you know that I'm so glad. They pray for me. Amen. Uh, a, a great job. We appreciate it so much. You laid the groundwork. Set the bar high, because I'm supposed to do something tomorrow, so. <laughs> I got my phone in my pocket. I record it. I just play it over. <laughs> Set the bar high, but, but, but I'm grateful. I'm grateful. And let me tell, tell you, I got other things, but let me tell you, when we, or when there is sermons preached, when the church goes through whatever it is that it goes through, we know that we are not saying this for the first time. 